Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Lindu out of Crops for Energy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first Biomass Connect webinar of 2024. Fingers crossed, this could be the year for biomass crops. So as always, uh, we've got a packed schedule and it will start with uh, me giving a brief introduction to the Biomass Connector website. Uh, then I will follow with a five minute intro to the subject at hand, which today is all about uh, biodiversity and biomass crops. Then I will pass over to two illustrious speakers who will tell us all about uh, the biodiversity that you can find in these crops. Um, throughout, there's a, an opportunity for you to use the chat function and uh, ask uh, pertinent questions. And I will moderate that in the Q&A session. And we will finish off with um, a sneak preview of the next webinar in February. So the Biomass Connect website. Now, talking about biodiversity, if you wanted to harness all of the biodiversity in the world, well, you'd have to build a huge arc. And essentially, that's what we're doing with the Biomass Connect website. We've created a vessel with uh, lots of information on all of the biomass crop species. And in a very, very short time, we've created what is a world class uh, knowledge hub of information. So if you have any questions about biomass, biomass crops, then your first port of call has to be the website um, and set sail for a voyage of discovery um, on the good ship biomassconnect.org. So what I love about biomass crops is the versatility. Um, it's not just the yields but it's also the land resource efficiency that you get uh, from, from that. Then on top of that, um, when you're growing these crops, you can get lots of uh, environmental protection measures. So think flood mitigation, think um, water quality protection. Now on top of that, when you harvest them, you can produce all sorts of amazing products. So anything that can be produced from fossil fuels can be produced from biomass, but without the huge carbon footprint. And if you do, uh, if you plant these crops really well and uh, you adhere to best practice, then you will almost certainly get biodiversity benefits. Now, with all that said, you would expect, or I would expect anyway, that uh, these very environmental crops should be right in the heart of uh, government uh, policy for agri-environment schemes. But until now, it's been conspicuous by its absence. And I just wanted to go back into a little bit of, uh, of history. I've been delving deep into the literature over the last couple of days. And I want to quote or paraphrase from a few papers. Uh, so back in 2006, Sage et al uh, said, biomass crops clearly have a potential role in the delivery of biodiversity targets and adds there could be potential benefit in developing agri-environment options. 2006, that's 18 years ago. Our first speaker today, Rebecca Rowe, in her 2011 paper, highlights the important role that SRC can play in ecosystem service provision uh, through the invertebrate life that inhabits these crops, uh, especially pollination services and biological control agents. She states that these are services essential to continued arable crop production worldwide. Wow. In her later paper, Rebecca states, these findings support the notion that willow SRC crops may benefit the environment. And she concludes, the results add, add weight to the argument that willow SRC should be considered for inclusion within, within agri-environment schemes. So that's uh, 11 years ago, and still we're waiting. Um, in the meantime, another paper or other papers have pointed out that uh, across Europe, uh, lots of um, schemes that are supposed to be for biodiversity and conservation benefit actually often have negative effects rather than positive ones. So I just wonder whether we've been backing the wrong horse for uh, in certain circumstances. My personal view is that we need to follow the science a little bit more. Now, a recent meta-analysis by Donison et al. looked at 2,364 papers um, on the subject, and um, I'm paraphrasing the conclusions here, but uh, in the vast majority of cases, biomass crops can provide positive results for biodiversity. So, as a result of all this literature, um, 
I feel that it's time for the pragmatic approach where academics and the industry at large, farmers, policymakers, and environmental NGOs come together into a, a collegiate approach and find a way forward. Uh, we need, all of us are natural allies because we're all fighting a common um, battle against climate change and we all want to preserve as much wildlife as possible. I'm sure that is the case. Um, and so I would like to share with you a wonderful Chinese proverb that uh, came my way recently. And it uh, is, keep a green tree in your heart and perhaps a songbird will come. And that's how I am uh, looking at this. Uh, so in today's webinar, we have two erudite speakers who will provide some views on the uh, biodiversity aspects of these crops, um, both from an academic and um, a, a slightly more of a um, Ed with his uh, slightly uh, coming from it from a, an outsider's view. So with the um, with Ed in the second part, we'll be looking at uh, two recent bird surveys that we did down in the southwest on SRC and Miscanthus. In the first half, we're looking, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, being presented to by um, Dr. Rebecca Rowe of the UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Now, Rebecca is a core member of the Biomass Connect team and has been in this line of work for 15 years. Um, even before I met Rebecca, I was already sharing her very influential papers and um, with many a good policymaker and conservation body. So Rebecca has a very difficult uh, task of condensing that 15 years of uh, knowledge accrual into a 15 minute talk. So I'm not gonna eat up any more of your time. Uh, so over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so I'm obviously gonna talk about measuring and the management of biodiversity in perennial bias crops, as Kevin's mentioned. So I'm from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and I'm based in our Lancaster site. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction to explain why we're so interested in the potential impact of these crops. So this is just some trends in farmland biodiversity over the last few years. So this is the farmland bird index. So this is 19 bird species that the government and other, uh, other sort of NGOs used to monitor farmland bird diversity. Um, so the 19 bird species were picked based on their affinity to these landscapes and their need for a whole range of different services and food sources from those. So looking back from 1970, we basically this is a percentage change. You can see there's been a decrease in those farmland bird species overall, with that beat decrease being strongest in what we call the specialist species. So these are the ones most heavily tied to that farmland diversity of uh, farmland landscape. So we can see a similar thing. So this is the this is data sorry from the uh, Joint Nature Conservation Council. Um, so they do uh, these uh, they pull data from all the different um, organisations do these surveys. So in terms of butterflies, so these are the wider countryside butterflies. So we find these are more generalist species. And here we find a sort of a slight but non-significant decrease since the 1990s when this metric started to be looked at. Um, and then for pollinator species, similar to the birds. So this is bees and hoverflies, and it's actually distribution rather than population. And again, this is um, indexing back to 1998, 1980, I think. And again, we see that sort of decrease in the species diversity. And these are ones associated with farmland species or farmland areas. So what we're finding in our farmland areas over this period is a generalised reduction in biodiversity, the loss of specifically or more of those specialist species. This link is, is potentially linked or thought to be linked. It's quite difficult to do this um, to land the, the reduction, the landscape diversity. So that's the sort of simplification of our landscape. So we've gone from farms with multiple different crops to a simplification of those crops um, and also the intensification of production methods. So things like switching from um, winter, spring sown crops to winter sown crops and the reduction in overwinter stubble, um, things like a reduction of weeds within the crop due to better planting methods and better um, crop hygiene. All of those things are kind of contributing together for this reduction in biodiversity. So coming into that, um, starting my PhD in 2006 when I started working on this, we're interested in how those perennial crops we might bring into the landscape, into this farmed landscape, are going to influence that biodiversity. Um, so I've worked on, in my PhD, I looked at, I did mammal, insect and plant diversity in Willow SRC, which is where those papers came from a long time ago. Um, since then, I've also looked at the impact of our ecosystem service. So things like um, soil carbon, water quality, water availability, greenhouse gas emissions, either myself or with colleagues. 
I've also done multiple evidence surveys. Um, so these are big star lit reviews or literature reviews, I say, both of the grey and of the academic publications, where we've looked at the where I've looked at again either myself or with colleagues on the impacts of a range range of energy grasses. So that's like miscanthus and switchgrass, mainly miscanthus, and our woody crops. So that's our short rotation copies, willow and poplar, and also short rotation forestry, and those impacts on biodiversity. And currently I'm moving now into exploring the influence of crop management. So that's things like the location and the uh, management of the crop. So over those years, there's some stuff we kind of know what the general benefits are. So these are some of the benefits of those perennial biomass crops. Um, so we know that in an agricultural dominated landscape, we can have these crops can increase bird, uh, insect and mammal diversity. So there's some graphs there at the top from my PhD. So that there's some looking at the abundance of insects against cereal crops versus uh, willow SRC. And you can see I get an increase in abundance and also the diversity. And this is specifically I was looking there at predatory insects. Um, and then the mammals, I realised earlier I have left this in Latin. So that starts with a wood mouse, bank vole, field vole, common shrew and pygmy shrew, um, the W being willow and the C being um, cereal crops, and that's inside the crop area, so I've excluded the margins in that. Um, and what I'm really looking at there, I've normalised that to 100%, but you can see that if you look at the red bars, that's breeding females. So what's particularly noticeable in that when I did that mammal survey is I find a much higher percentage and number of breeding females in the willow crop than I was finding in the cereal crop, suggesting it might act as a, a resource for repopulating the area. There's also a lot of barn owls um, hunting in my headlands when I went out for morning mammal trapping, eating my, eating my subjects. Um, we also know that these crops can provide shelter from predators. So there's some really good work being done on, not by me, <laughs> by other scientists in the UK, um, looking at, um, so they radio trapped hares. And what you can see in the little grey bars is the hash stuff is the miscanthus. And what they were seeing is that the hares were using the miscanthus to rest in and as shelter, and then going in and out to feed. They weren't feeding within or on the miscanthus, um, but they were feeding on the surrounding habitat. But they were preferentially selecting areas with miscanthus. So the conclusion of that paper is this crop can help this species by providing a safe refuge from them. They do struggle in agricultural landscapes managed um, for things like leverage, um, raising their young because of the, the sort of tillage of the, and the harvesting of those fields. We know the crops can potentially act as wildlife corridors. We can use them to link up habitats to allow species to travel that do not like to or will not cross open agricultural land. So animals that would, how they would use a hedgerow, you can use a miscanthus field in the same way or willow field in the same way. It might be particularly valuable in somewhere like Lincolnshire where you have very little hedgerows, it's all dikes. Um, we know the benefits are generally greater in SRC than they are in the energy grasses. So what we normally find is that while certainly for birds, miscanthus might have a more sort of neutral effect on the overall biodiversity, maybe slightly positive, you're generally going to find a much more positive effect in your short rotation coppice. And that's because it tends to have an understory and it's generally more palatable. It has a higher insect diversity generally as well. Um, that's not to say the miscanthus doesn't have benefits, it's just a slight shift. For short rotation forestry, it's probably quite variable. We don't have a huge amount of data for short rotation forestry, simply because there's not a huge amount in the UK. It will probably depend quite heavily on the management. If you're going to encourage an understory of um, flowering plants and your um, short rotation forestry, that's going to have a much more beneficial effect than if you're being very aggressive in your weed control under the crops. We also know that the crop margins of both crops offer additional benefit. They used to be quite wide. They are shrinking slightly in some of the crops. Um, but those those um, crop margins, they don't get they don't suffer from spray drift because we don't generally put herbicide on these crops. They don't. Um, obviously, they're not being tilled to the same extent. And they also have quite a lot of shelter because the crop's quite tall. Um, that can offer additional benefits to things like um, butterflies and other pollinators. Um, it does depend on the width for the margin, obviously. There are some risks, though. It's important to say this is not all beneficial. It's not all, you know, it's not say the overall biodiversity increases. But what you do get is a, is a shift in the species composition. So higher biodiversity is true, but it's not necessarily the same species you're getting in your, in your agricultural landscape. 
So we generally see a decrease in open farmland bird species with some flock forming winter birds as well. So that's things like skylarks and lapwings that like to nest in a very open environment and things like some of your corvid species, things like wood pigeon, which are actually in the index, um, that like to flock feed during the winter because they can't see each other in the crop in the willow and miscanthus, therefore they generally don't like to feed in there. And then some of your rare arable weeds are very dependent on tillage. I think I've got corn crackle and um, it's a pheasant eye, I think, red pheasant eye of the pictures in there. So they will decrease and you're going to increase in species that are associated with scrub and hedgerows in terms of the birds and actually the insects as well. And then perennial plants and weeds. So actually things like nettle, coxfoot, some of those really sort of perennial grasses will go up. Um, more under the crop in, so that's both under and around the crop in SLC, and then that's around the crop in the Miscanthus. Miscanthus doesn't have a great understory or a huge amount of understory. The impacts are dependent on the location, the scale of the planting and the management of the crop. So where you put the crop in the landscape, depending on whether the species are there or not, how much you plant in a given area, talk about the hairs coming in and out, and how you manage crop will influence these impacts. Uh, and we can manage them to mitigate any of those uh, any of those negative or potentially negative impacts. So what I'm currently doing at the moment is, as I said, managing a little, focusing a little bit more on that management of the biodiversity. So I'm looking at crop location for farmland birds. So I'm attempting to make some heat maps with some colleagues here at CEH. So what we're doing is we're combining the BTO bird density map that tells me where the farmland birds are and where their numbers are. So I, you can't negatively impact a bird if it's not there. I'm using published survey data to assign their preferences. So whether they prefer to be an SLC or prefer to be in an arable field or maybe a grassland field. And I'm using the UKCH land cover map, which actually goes down to field resolution and will tell me which crop is in what field. Um, the resolution of the underpinning BTO data is kilometre scale. So I'll scale this back up and that will give us sort of a UK wide heat map of where we might get the best benefits for placing the crop within the landscape based on what's there already. In terms of crop management, again, this is work I'm going to do with BTO and this time with Ferro Scientific as well. And we're currently doing this, this is a DEFRA funded project. Where we're going out now, we started surveying last year, we'll continue this next year. At the moment, we're looking or have looked so far at crop management in SLC and Miscanthus. So we've looked at wildflower uh, mixes, margin width and the frequency of cutting and herbicide application to try and explore what what the relationship is between those management and the potential biodiversity benefit. Um, for SLC, we're expanding this as well to look inside the crop. So we're looking at varietal choice and the use of interrow spraying and cultivation. It's important to note that spraying and cultivating a crop isn't necessarily bad for biodiversity. These crops are quite dominated by um, very common what we'd call aggressive grass species. So sometimes cultivation and herbicide application can actually aid biodiversity. Um, I am looking for additional sites. If you are doing stuff like this in your willow and miscanthus fields um, and you want to get in contact or you're doing other activities you think are beneficial, we should be aware of, please contact me. I am interested. We're also potentially interested for the BTO at looking at the density of planting. So if you have large amounts of miscanthus or willow planted in a small area, we're also interested in that. Not necessarily your own fields, but groups of fields. OK, so what do we know? Um, so having said all this, obviously, I did the work. One of the things I did with Ferra or Ferra led on that we did together was to actually look at what data is out there around the management up to this date and how strong or otherwise that evidence is. So that's the table you can see on the right, um, which Defra have kindly said I was allowed to show. Um, what we know from that, from that work is, and obviously all my past research, is that edges are gen and other people's past research should be clear on that, is that edges are best. So if you can maximise your edge to interior ratio of your crop, that's probably going to benefit your biodiversity the greatest. And that's because those crossover habitats are particularly good for biodiversity. We know that it's good to aim for a diverse landscape. So if you can mix your perennial biomass crops into intensive grass and intensive arable crops, you'll have the most benefit. The more intensive the landscape is, the more benefit you get from putting these crops in because it adds in an additional habitat that is not there already. Um, and it gives those species that are potentially struggling to maintain their populations in that habitat a really important resource. Um, if you have SRC, you have a 
a mixed age stand. So if you have multiple plots of SRC and you harvest them in different years, having multiple different ages of those stands, because they're harvested every sort of three years, different species associate with different ages of stands. By having a mix of age, you therefore maximise that biodiversity within that area. Obviously, if you can use them for wildlife corridors to link up woodland or wild areas on inner landscape, that's hugely beneficial because it allows those species to move between those habitats. Um, should be fairly obvious, please avoid field used or containing sensitive species. If you have fields you know contain particularly rare species it would not, that would be sensitive to these crops, then it'd be best to avoid those. Um, preserving crop margins and utilising current biodiversity focused schemes, which I'm just going to mention in a minute, so to maximise the biodiversity value of those margins. Um, and the other thing we need to think about is managing our whole farm. Willow and Miscanthus are part of the farm. If you can manage your retained arable and grassland areas in ways that will benefit the at-risk species, you can maximise that biodiversity of your farm as a whole. So this is like an additional thing you can add into your farm or to, into a landscape to maximise the biodiversity in that landscape, um, rather than potentially losing the crop as a fix-it system. So rural payments, this is why I put a huge caveat on this. This is not my area of expertise. I am not a rural payment expert. So please check with your local advisor. Do not you know, assume that I know this correctly. But this is what I know as of 2030. I'm going to do England, Scotland and Wales. So in England, if you are part of or planning to be part of countryside stewardship, either mid or higher tier, the crop, so your um, Miscanthus and willow crop mar crops margins, the outside of the crop, the unplanted hedgerows, are eligible for biodiversity management actions, providing the wider criteria met. So if you want to plant wildflower margins or put in hedgerows, providing you match all the other criteria, those crops themselves are not are eligible, not because they're there, but because they're, they're not, not, they're cross compliant, if you like. The other one that's recently come out is the Sustainable Farming Initiative. This, for the first time, has Willow Miscanthus named as and classified as permanent non-horticultural crops. That means within that you can have, so the list is there, this is a list of all the things that apply to those crops. Uh, Flower-rich margins are in there. Um, it is a slightly different seed mix, or potentially a slightly different seed mix, the country stewardship, so please double check that. Um, you can put a, you can get payments for non-herbicide over the entire cropped area. You can get payments for hedgerow management. They can also be part of the whole farm agreement. So things that's integrated um, pest management plans, nutrient management and soil organic matter testing and plans. Some of those will have direct biodiversity benefits. Things like nutrient management will help um, streams on your farm, for example. Um, some of them are a bit more general. So I have looked for Northern Ireland and I couldn't find anything. And obviously with the assembly not sitting at the moment, that's probably not surprising. It's worth noting a lot of these are still in development as well. So in Scotland, the Agriculture Environment Climate Scheme doesn't necessarily, doesn't specifically mention Willow or Miscanthus. And I'm not entirely sure that they are compliant. And I could only see one option I think potentially is applicable, which is wild bird seed mix for farmland, wild bird farmland, it's exactly where wild bird seed for farmed birds in crop margins. Um, that one I think maybe we'd well, have to check. Um, and then there's the preparing for sustainable farming, which gives you an indication they are developing new um, standards in Scotland. So there's an opportunity there um, for how, for whole farm carbon audits would be in, but it's not biodiversity specific. For Wales, there's a sustainable farming scheme, which is under development. And the consultation I think is still open. It replaces habitat scheme for Wales. There's no, again, no specific mention of biomass crops within those. Um, the SR, the SFS draft does require this 10% forestry or tree cover, but it's not clear whether or not SRC and SRF will be eligible under that. Um, but as I said, the consultation is open, it is in development. There, is, there was, just to close, the Agricultural Diversification Scheme. I, there may be another round of that. That's often the case with these. That isn't a biodiversity payment, but it does support the planting of biomass crops for, um, for under new farm enterprises. So if you're going to produce a crop to sell off farm for fibre bedding or energy, you could potentially get a payment. That's for SLC Amos Campus, by the way, I think. Um, it covers capital costs, so it would cover things like planting material. So in summary, we know that payment options are under development in the devolved nations and to a degree in the UK as well, or in England, I should say. Uh, payments for biodiversity-friendly crop margins are available, at least in England. 
the payments targeted for the management of cropped areas are limited and more generalised, but that is partly because they are compensation payments. They pay farmers for doing things that cost them money. We don't really have options in Willow and Scampers of the crop area that cost, that cost the farmer money. Therefore, there's limit payment for that. So I think I'm done. Should say questions. Next slide. There you go. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. That's uh, brilliant and a real whistle stop there um, through uh, a tremendous amount of work that you've done <laughs> in the years. Um, I've got a couple of questions uh, just um, first off. So are there any issues with planting, uh, management and harvesting that undermine a biomass crops biodiversity potential? Are any of the BFI funded projects addressing uh, those aspects in your knowledge? So we have, there is um, a degree of, I don't know if the Biomass Connect directly, there is a look at um, things like, so planting, obviously the tillage of the crop, if you can minimise um, things like soil disturbance, it's going to benefit, or if you can minimise herbicide applications. So at the moment, these crops need a completely clean seabed in order to be planted, or generally planted with a completely clean seabed. So anything that would help to maintain um, plant diversity during that stage. The other thing I'm potentially looking at, hopefully, I've just got some funding to do, is to look at under the uh, in SRC with um, plants that potentially would be beneficial to the crop and beneficial to biodiversity. So that's deliberately sowing plants in after, under SRC after harvest to, to maximise that potential biodiversity value, but also potentially to give nitrogen fixing as well. Oh, and what about the, the timing of operations, so harvesting in particular? Yeah, so harvesting generally is done outside of things like the breeding season. Um, however, it is starting to slip. So anything, we generally want to avoid harvesting these crops during the breeding season. That runs from late March usually to early July. It's going to com confirm that. It's shifting. That sh breeding season is shifting as well. Because the crops generally are harvested early in the year, that tends to avoid that. However, yeah, later harvesting would be a risk. However, you have to balance that with being able to access the crop. Um, obviously, SRC is only harvested once a year, uh, once every three years, Miscampus more regularly. Um, the alternative is to har harvest sort of um, October, November time, but then you've got to be on the crop. We have to remember these are commercial crops as well at the end of the day. So um, there is a balance to be had there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. We'll bring you back into the, um, the panel session a little bit later on. Um, I'm just going to um, uh, mention the website again. Uh, we've got a great search facility in, in the, the website. So if you've got um, a term that you want to search for, um, just like biodiversity, then uh, search it. You won't get all of the uh, loads of irrelevant stuff. You'll get all of the very hot off the press relevant stuff. So uh, search biodiversity and you'll, you'll get straight to it. Um, as I said, it's a Noah's Ark of information. Um, moving to our next speaker. Um, as uh, birthday presents go, um, I had a really good one a couple of years ago uh, when I was uh, when I turned 50. Uh, my wife gave me a bird watching experience with a uh, wildlife guru and uh, ornithologist uh, Ed Druitt. Um, it was during lockdown and uh, like most people, I, I was desperate to get out into the countryside and uh, hear and see um, um, wildlife and uh, it was an absolute joy to, uh, to to be out with such an enthusiastic fellow as Ed. Now he is a gun for hire so he can uh, he could do the same for you if you wanted to. Um, I wanted to take him to uh, some SRC Willow and Miscanthus plantations for a long time because he's not within the industry at all and has, a, has a completely um, no vested interest in this, but I wanted to just take him and uh, plonk him in the middle of a field and uh, get him to say what he heard and saw. So um, I'm going to not steal any more of your thunder Ed, <laughs> and uh, pass straight over to you and you can tell us all about it. So thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. And a great presentation there from Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Really, some really nice context there, some really nice science as well, and linking up all these different things that are going on and really important survey data being done there also uh, by the Centre for Hydrology and Ecology and also the British Task for Ornithology. What I'm going to do in the next sort of 12, 15 minutes or so is kind of give you more of a sort of visual feast, I guess, of some of those things that Rebecca's been talking about and complement some of those points that Rebecca's been making really through through some images of some of those some of those insects some of those uh, small animals and birds and um, in the second half really of it I'm going to talk a bit more about what we call this kind of gold standard this kind of if we want to make uh, 
some of these crops really good for wildlife as well as uh, a crop um, as Rebecca was just sort of finishing off with really there what is it what sort of interventions can be done which which can still make it you know even better for, for wildlife one of the key things of course is it's very easy to think about the birds and the mammals etc because those are the things that often um, excite people and also they are the things that we most obviously see but actually it's getting down to the small stuff which feeds those bats and those birds and everything else and actually particularly when we go to something like a willow plantation willow uh, all the different sort of species willow produce these fantastic catkins very early in the season and these provide important early nectar and pollen for pollinators and certainly uh, research from the University of Bristol shows that, that uh, you know, this is a really important food for some of these early insects coming out. And not just the obvious ones like the honeybee on the left and the bumblebee on the right. There's a very tiny insect actually just on the catkin there below the bumblebee. But we're also talking about other pollinators such as moths. Moths are very important pollinators, hoverflies. Um, we've also got our solitary bees and solitary wasps and a whole plethora of other insects as well. So it's about supporting them, which of course in turn will then support some of those other animals and birds that we do tend to notice more. If we go into the next slide, we can see some, of, some other examples here. We've got our snails, some banded snails on the left there, which provide important food um, for tiny parasitoid uh, insects, but also for birds such as song thrushes. On the right hand side, we've got aphids, important food for predators such as ladybirds and lacewings and also food for some of the smaller birds that I'm going to talk about in a short while. In the next slide, we can see uh, sawfly larvae. These turn into flying insects that provide important food for bats, for example. Um, but even when they're on the leaves like this, they get gleaned off um, by small birds such as goldcrests and wrens that we're going to see in a short while. In the next slide, we can see hairy caterpillars. The hairy caterpillars are really important food for one particular declining farmland bird, the cuckoo. Their sole diet is hairy caterpillars. We need more of them basically in the countryside. A lot of them have disappeared through the sort of intensification of agricultural practices. Um, so we want more caterpillars. Yes, they do feed on things like the willow leaves, but they do provide food for birds. And the more birds we have and other animals that eat them, uh, the more likely it is that they're going to be kind of kept under close control. Um, but of course, these do turn into moths and butterflies. And the next slide shows us a lovely small tortoiseshell butterfly. Used to be one of our most common butterflies in Britain, but now it's much less common and declining. But they love nettles. And of course, if miscanthus and willow particularly are going to be planted in places where the soil is still very fertile and there's a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen, you're going to get lots of nettles growing and those provide important food for butterflies such as painted lady, red admiral, small tortoiseshell and comma and some of those are declining butterflies, some of those such as the comma aren't doing too badly. So it's all about thinking about this bigger picture of all these different wildlife species that are that are you know potentially able to tap into these plantations. The next slide shows us uh, some of the stuff that we get on the ground. We've got two ground beetles here um, just a small number of the many ground and rove beetles that you might get in Miscanthus and Willow. The one on the left there loves to feed on seeds. The one on the right loves to feed on other invertebrates. It's a predator. And these in turn provide food for um, hedgehogs, for example, insectivores such as shrews. If they're flying, they might provide food for bats. And of course, they're providing food also for ground feeding birds. We look at the next slide we can start thinking about what some of these birds actually look like that Rebecca's been talking about those those species that are uh, used uh, in the countryside as kind of uh, bio indicators and when Kevin and I were out in the countryside back in November we were spotting Britain's smallest bird uh, the gold crest it does have a relative the fire crest which is less common in the in sort of farmland environments but this gold crest if we look at the next slide as well was foraging amongst the hedgerows but as Rebecca was saying, importantly, it was very much using the edge habitat and it was moving between the hedgerow and, in this case, the miscanthus, feeding on the edge. 
And the next slide shows us our second smallest bird in Britain, the wren, doing exactly the same. As we were going around all the miscanthus fields, the wrens were dotting between the edge habitat, some of the grasslands, some of the hedgerows, some of the wild flowers that were left in the autumn. Uh, and feeding on the edge of that miscanthus. So that edge habitat where you've got most of your light, you've got most of your uh, non-crop plants growing, is where you're finding things like the goldcrest and the wrens. Now, we saw those beetles. The next slide shows us the blackbird, for example. Here's a female blackbird. The next one shows us our song thrush. And the one after this shows us our red wing, which is a winter bird that comes here from Scandinavia. And when we don't have the freezing weather that we've got at the moment, which locks the ground up to a lot of these invertebrates, these birds are feeding on things such as those banded snails I showed you earlier. They're feeding on the ground beetles, they're feeding on things like centipedes and wood lice uh, and worms and all sorts of things like that. And the leaf litter that you get building up in amongst the willow plantations and also in amongst those miscanthus provides the cover for those invertebrates that these birds can then feed on. In the next slide, we are looking at perhaps some of our smaller birds that we're going to get here more in the springtime. So I showed you those aphids, for example, and those sawfly larvae. And those in turn produce food for some of our small warblers that arrive here in the springtime. This is a chiff chaff, for example, but birds such as willow warblers and black caps will also benefit from these small insects. The next slide shows us the uh, long-tailed tits, fabulous little bird. They This time of the year, they're going around in large flocks, maybe 12 to 20 birds. And then they start to pair off in February time, often nesting in bramble scrub, for example. And the next photograph shows us one that Kevin and I saw back in November. You can just see it in the middle there. And what they do is they go from branch to branch, in this case, in the willow plantation. And they're looking for the tiny eggs and pupa chrysalises of caterpillars. Uh, of, sort of, of moths and butterflies that have been laid on those branches back in the summer and autumn and they're going around looking for them and, and gleaning them off and this is a great example of again the, the long-tailed tits coming out of uh, connected habitat and, and feeding just on the edge of this plantation and in this case actually they moved through it. The next slide um, shows us a bird that, that Kevin saw actually you can just see it in the middle of this plantation the next slide shows us in a little bit closer this is a white throat um, a bird that comes here from West Africa. Often you find these in hedgerows uh, along our farmland, but actually willow plantations provide them with some great food. And you can see how ragged the leaves of this willow is, where it's obviously been eaten by caterpillars and sawflies. And it's worth at this point just, just mentioning, actually, if we just go back again, sorry, Nana, that um, oak trees provide us with, um, provide wildlife in, in Britain with, with the most variety of, of wildlife. So an oak tree can support 2,300 species. That includes lichens, mosses and insects, around about 284 insect species. And willow is second. Willow is second to oak in Britain in supporting the most number of, of, of wildlife, basically. And, and it supports about 266 insect species. Um, so, you know, having that willow crop there is, 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 is going to help insect life and other things that are wanting to live uh, in the farmland environment. The next slide shows us um, siskin. Th these are siskins that Kevin and I did actually see in November. The next slide shows you one in a little bit sort of clearer light. Um, siskins are a bird of evergreen, um, uh, kind of pine woodland and forest like that. But we saw a flock coming down, again, probably using some of the connected edge habitats, but they did actually come into the willow plantation as well, maybe for cover. I'm not quite sure. And in the next slide, we can see uh, woodcock. Now we have woodcock nesting breeding in Britain. It's a declining breeding population, sadly, but we do get lots of woodcock coming here from um, Europe as well. And they like to live perhaps in some of those younger plantations where they can get cover during the daytime. They might well feed still on earthworms and then they come out at night to feed on nearby pastures and meadows looking for earthworms and things like that. So um, certainly these plantations of both species can be important for them, but miscanthus in particular for woodcock in the wintertime. And it's all about, if we go to the next slide now, it's also about, um, as Rebecca was saying, really, having different age groups. Now, we don't see so much of it today in our woodlands, but many of you may be familiar with the coppicing and pollarding. And many of our woodlands would have been coppiced in rotation 
uh, hundred hundred years ago and before that for thousands of years. And that would have provided different woodland environments for different birds and insects, etc., at different periods in that rotation. And we can achieve the same thing with our plantations. A lot of research out there has been done on young miscanthus, like we can see in front of you there. But to the left, we've got the more mature stuff, which is what Kevin and I were looking at in the autumn. But as ever, really, it's about having a mix of this a mosaic environment of these different crop ages, which then supports wildlife in different sorts of way at different sorts of stages. So when it is young like this and more open, it does, for example, provide, as in the next slide, space for birds such as metapipits. You often find these up in moorland and coastal areas, but they will use miscanthus. And in the next slide, also for birds such as skylarks, a bird of steppe habitat, grass and environments, which will also use young yellow willow when it's just been cut and also very young miscanthus, although Rebecca was uh, telling me the other day that, that, that they don't necessarily do very well breeding wise, say miscanthus at this age, but certainly they will use it. Following on in the next slide, we can then uh, follow on. Now, the metapipits and skylarks are both uh, sort of red or amber listed species, which means that uh, alongside a whole suite of other species, their populations have sown significant declines over the last 25, 30 years. Um, for them to be put into this kind of draft traffic like system so that we can be aware of which birds need the most attention in terms of their conservation. So which birds are going to maybe benefit? Well, in this picture here, we're looking at a very small finch, a farmland finch called the linnet. And the next photograph shows you uh, what it looks like up close. And when Kevin and I were, were watching the willow plantation back in November, we were delighted to see a flock of about 60 linnets coming in to roost, coming in to sleep in that willow plantation. And we do see from some of the research actually that miscanthus and willow can provide important shelter for farmland birds, maybe even woodland birds, but certainly farmland birds during the winter months. In the next slide, we can also see other birds that are, that are popping in and out of these kind of plantations. Dunnocks, for example, these are a declining um, countryside bird. We, we get them in the garden, but they are declining. And again, this is a bird a little bit like the gold crest and the wren that's perhaps jumping in between the hedgerows and the willow and the miscanthus looking for small invertebrates. We come back now in the next slide to the song thrush. I mentioned this earlier. Song thrushes love snails and snails and slugs are particularly important for feeding their young in June, July time. Um, but also in the winter, when we were in the willow plantation and the miscanthus in November, we were hearing lots of song thrushes just calling in these plantations. And when they find snails, perhaps in amongst the nettles and amongst the brambles, they'll then find a, a stone called an anvil where they'll smash the snail against that and feed on them. As ever, when you've got things like your ladybirds, you've got your song thrushes feeding on what might otherwise be regarded as pest species. When you have a good balance of all these predators, um, then actually you're going to have a much better balance of all these things that would otherwise be feasting on the leaves of things such as the willow. Now, in the next slide, we've got a, a wonderful little bird. Well, before that, sorry, this is what the miscanthus was looking like in November. Uh, we had a really good harsh frost towards the end of November, so it was looking really very pretty. What was very interesting, though, to note was that the surrounding kind of improved grassland fields were pretty empty of any wildlife, apart from the odd deer um, and rabbit, perhaps. The bird life was very much in the woodland here and in the miscanthus. And we were delighted to see the next bird in the next slide. This is the pied wagtail. This is a bird that during the daytime in the winter will be spread around different farmsteads, car parks and things like that. And what was incredible was that half an hour before it was starting to get dark, um, we counted over a thousand pied wagtails. That's over a thousand pied wagtails coming in to this man's miscanthus plantation to roost. It was really incredibly exciting. And the next slide doesn't do it justice, but it does show a couple of birds just on the wires there. And we were seeing flocks coming in of 10, 15 here and they're coming into roost. It was really fantastic to see. And this supports this, the, you know, the papers out there that talk about the fact that they provide these winter shelters for birds, as well as there being non crop plants to provide insects for different birds. The next slide also shows us the rebunting. So from July onwards, miscanthus can often be important for, for birds such as rebuntings that might be feeding and roosting in these areas. And when I say feeding, that the miscanthus itself isn't necessarily a great food plant, but it's often the non-crop plants in between or on the edge of the miscanthus that's providing food for these birds.
We come back to the Skylark. I mentioned the Skylark earlier. We certainly saw some Skylarks flying over and around in this Miscanthus, perhaps coming into roost. And as I mentioned earlier on, they do prefer uh, the willow crop and the Miscanthus crop when it's much younger stages. And perhaps surprisingly also in the next slide, we see the Yellowhammer and the next slide, the Wood Pigeon. And then the next slide, also the Starling making use of these fields. Um, now, we did actually thought that these starlings were going to come into roost to the willow plantation. The next slide shows you what we saw. We saw this fantastic flock of about a thousand birds um, feeding in an adjacent kind of um, uh, stubble field, actually. And I thought I was convinced they were going to come into the willow crop. But then just as they were about to, a sparrowhawk came through and they all disappeared off, presumably to a different roost because um, they, they, they do they will have a number of different roosts that they will use and we didn't see them come in. Incidentally, the research does show that starlings kind of will will use uh, not, you know, the non miscanthus and the non willow just as much as they will use the willow and miscanthus. So they don't necessarily have a, a strong preference for it, but it was interesting seeing them in the wider landscape. Now, Rebecca also mentioned about some of those other birds that perhaps do need this open landscape, uh, birds such as the yellow wagtail that love wet meadows, potato fields and things like that, the grey partridge, the corn bunting. And in the next slide, we also see the stone curlew. And these are birds of open step in habitat, um, which take advantage of our open farmland areas in the UK. And of course, um, if you've got short rotational crops being planted in Miscanthus, which are very tall um, at certain points in their lifetime, then of course that's going to remove certain habitats. And as ever, really, I think it's about making sure that surveys are done to know where these birds are and to make sure really that where they these crops are planted, they are done in such a way that minimises the impact on these species that are declining anyway. They're declining for other reasons. But of course, you can always get that nail in the coffin by sometimes planting things in the wrong places at the wrong time. So in the remaining five minutes, how based on kind of what you've just seen and what you've heard from Rebecca really, complimenting what Rebecca said, what are some of the things that can be done to really help some of the wildlife in the wider farmland landscape that may also be coming into and perhaps preferring to use some of these plantations? Well, perhaps a no-brainer is lights. And if we look at the next uh, image really of some of the, of the willow plantation, we can see that when they're densely packed together, it stops things growing deep down. We space things out a little bit, little light, little let a little bit more light in or have patches that are unplanted, then that allows non crop plants to grow up that are potentially going to compete with the willow. They're going to be sort of low down, but they are going to provide some nectar. They're going to provide some food for caterpillars, for example, and also little stepping stones. If you've got birds or bats or insects moving through the countryside, little stepping stones of feeding places, for example, for bumblebees, just provides that little bit of extra food and opportunity and, and greater likelihood of survival, basically. The next point to make is, uh, or here we've got some yarrow, for example, just growing on the edge of Miscanthus. Again, just an example how non-crop plants can be growing where there's a bit of light. The next um, point is connectivity, and Rebecca touched on this, but it's thinking about the crops uh, as part of the bigger picture the farmland picture, but also part of the, the wider landscape picture of how these crop plants can be connected up with other landscapes and other similar environments and habitats. And actually wildlife doesn't want to be in the, in the middle of a willow plantation that's bang in the middle of nothing else. It, you know, if it's connected to hedgerows and connected to woodlands and connected to uh, other beneficial crop plants, then wildlife is more likely to use it. So if we go through the next uh, number of slides here, we can see exactly what I mean. It's just some oak uh, scrub, an oak copse that's growing uh, adjacent to a willow plantation. The next one shows you the willow plantation with a hedgerow next to it and beyond that some woodland. Lots of connectivity here for the bird life that we saw. The next slide shows us um, uh, on the left hand side, some bramble scrub, some sallow, some oak that's growing along a, a railway. Uh, corridor. Um, and this is where things like the gold crest, the long tail tip, the siskins were kind of jumping across into the willow plantation and then moving through the willow plantation. And that perhaps wouldn't happen in the same way if that willow plantation was bang in the middle of an oasis of nothing. Um, it would be a lot more difficult because a lot of these birds and bats, example, would be much more prone to predation from sparrowhawks, for example. 
The next slide shows us a little bit more of that connectivity with our Miss Campus, for example. This one in Somerset is surrounded by ancient woodland, ancient hedgerows. And again, we saw birds very much moving between the woodland and the hedgerows and the Miss Campus, on the edge of it particularly. And despite it being wintertime, birds very much foraging on the ground. And then, of course, at dusk coming into roost in it. So the next couple of slides shows us some of that connectivity. Lovely oak tree here, lovely hedgerows allowing the birds to move around and make use of the miscanthus if and when they want to. So the next one is about choosing the right location. And if we look at the next picture here, we can see that we've got um, a wildflower meadow. We've only got 3% of our unimproved wildflower meadows left in the UK. We don't want to be plonking a willow plantation or miscanthus on top of something like this. So again, a little bit like those real red data birds, like the great partridge, the yellow hammer, the stone curlew. It's about making sure that we know what's on uh, land before it's planted up with these crop plantation and making sure that whatever, wherever it's going to be going on to, it isn't already a valuable habitat for wildlife. And we're having the same questions and the same things being talked about where tree planting is, the, is, is, a big, is on the agenda. And already there have been examples of trees being planted in the wrong places at the wrong time and having to be dug back up again because they're otherwise destroying a fantastic wildflower meadow, for example. The next point to make is water. If you want to have and enhance these crops, then put water in, put in different spaces. The next um, uh, image shows you perhaps a, a big pool, but actually it's about having different levels of water, having a little water puddle. Uh, a pond the size of a puddle, having something a little bit bigger, more the size of a garden pond, and then perhaps some, having something even bigger that might well attract in ducks, dragonflies, underwater life, even your kingfisher. If you have water near, close to, in the middle of these plantations where it's still um, easy for, for, for a, a tractor or, or whatever mechanical cutter to get around, then you're really going to enhance the wildlife. There's going to be food for bats, there's going to be food for water birds, there's going to be food for insects such as your dragonflies, etc. It's really going to enhance what you're going to have there. The next uh, point to make is, is think about harvest time and different stages of growth. So the first image uh, we've touched on a little bit uh, in the next slide, which is about having um, uh, making sure that there's there's different stages of growth, that we don't just have willow all at the same age, we don't just have miscanthus all at the same age, that actually we have different layers at different stages, providing habitats and a mosaic jigsaw environment that's benefiting different species in different ways at period, different periods of time. But as Rebecca touched on, it's also thinking about um, when to crop and also thinking about technology and how technology can help us. So I've heard a lot about how some of these crops are not crop not not harvested till April time because the soil is too wet. The problem is is that birds are nesting in March and with climate change even earlier in February now. And many of the many of our farmland birds such as dunnox and white throats and linnets are nesting into September, maybe even till mid to end of September. So if we're cutting these crops at that time, we're potentially uh, removing uh, eggs and babies, cutting them up in amongst the, all these crops. And this can potentially be avoided if the crops are cut during the autumn and the winter time. But it might be that technology has to catch up, that you've got things that can cut these crops that perhaps have caterpillars um, or, or, or things that are, that are able to, to move through waterlogged soil and do obviously least damage the soil. We don't want soil compaction and all this sort of stuff going on. But I think it is something to kind of consider and think about when these crops are being harvested. The next point to make um, is chemical free. We've, we've talked uh, a lot about so kind of um, trying to reduce um, sprays and, and, and thinking about predators. But if we go to the next slide here, um, Rebecca touched on integrated pest management. This is thinking about having the birds and having the insects doing the work for you, having the ladybird larvae, like the one in the middle here, feeding on the insects rather than having to spray pesticides. If you can have as many of the natural predators as possible from the lacewings and the ladybirds, which are the song thrushes and the spotted flycatchers in these plantations eating these insects, then that's brilliant. Whereas if they're sprayed, you're not going to have them. The next thing is about people and wildlife watching. So if we look at the next slide, there's that Kevin and I have talked about this potential for if you have those ponds, if you have a feeding station where birds can come to feed, if you have these kind of richer patches of, of life in amongst these plantations, then there's a real lure there for people to come and watch and see. 
And if it's on a farm and people are coming to stay in a B and B, perhaps it's an additional kind of selling point. Perhaps it's even an um, an opportunity for people to pay and come and watch the wildlife, which may compensate for some of those losses of crop where you've got a pond or you've got some open spaces. And then finally, um, again touching on what Rebecca's talking about, that effective agriculture environment options, it's thinking about having unplanted patches that allow some of those non-crop plants to grow up and provide nectar and food for for pollinators and and uh, things that will feed much more on the leafy stuff those gaps between the crop and the hedgerows that we saw in some of those slides perhaps having some pollinator flowers or winter food crops in there i know with the miscanthus that we went we went to in november there was an issue there with some of the grasses being quite aggressive and not allowing some of those flowering plants through and Rebecca touched on that a little bit as well but there is that potential there and there's also the potential of having the pollinator mixes as well. The next slide just shows us an example of that where where we had the miscanthus crop we had um, knapweed and knapweed in turn provides great pollen and nectar for which shows us the burdit moth for example and other moths and butterflies and in the final slide just to finish off Kevin and I are going to be visiting these, uh, these miscanthus and willow in March and June um, to see what else is going to be using these crops during that time. And I'm looking forward to try and see if I can spot the reed warbler, a bird of wetland habitat normally, but a bird that is also known to utilise and use willow and miscanthus crops. Thank you. Thanks so, so much, Ed. Um, I can't wait to get out uh, to um a plot with you very very soon uh, and uh, see some more bird life uh, with, with my binoculars um I've, I've got a couple of questions um firstly uh, for you so if we were looking at a planting some of these crops to a gold standard and uh, say um, populations of 20 bird species were increased but perhaps one um, was excluded uh, what is more important the many or the few well, that's a, it's a good question. I think it depends on what the conservation status is potentially of that bird. Um, conservation organisations now are looking at um, conservation and wildlife recovery on a landscape scale now. So we're moving away from just kind of single species conservation and moving to much more of a landscape scale. Now, you know, single species conservation can benefit everything else. If we look at barn owls that Rebecca mentioned, if we look at um, birds of certain other birds of prey, etc., you know, or bitterns in wetlands, you know, if we get things right for the bittern and the barn owl, we often get things right for other things. But but there is a shift now to a much more landscape scale basis. So I think to answer your question, what we're trying to do in the landscape is make it more diverse, make it more mosaic, make it allow it to appeal to not just our generalists that are actually doing very well, in, very well in the countryside, but our specialists that need very particular foods and very particular habitats. So I think it depends on what that species is. Um, but if, if, the, if, you know, if, if it was like the only kind of grey partridge or, or stone curler population in that part of the county, then, you know, that could be quite a kind of red alert. And, and I think questions could be asked about, well, actually, you know, could it could it be done in a, a place where actually it's not going to affect that particular species? Mm. Obviously, if it's, if it's going to be something like the Skylark, for example, the well, Skylarks, you know, do have the opportunity to to use a range of different farm and environments. So it may may have less of an impact on them. But I think it depends on what the species is, what its conservation status is. Um, and just and I think just that wider landscape picture of what's going on elsewhere around around that area. OK, uh, Rebecca, do you have any views on that as well? Uh, well, yeah, and you say that's the same things I'm looking at. So that that um, heat mapping I'm going to do, the plan is to weight that by a combination of conservation status and rarity. So the Skylark, like I said, not only that, they actually nest a lot in uplands. So their actual population number in the UK is relatively high. Even though they're declining, that sounds like an odd thing. It matters they're declining, but their population, while some other species like the turtle dove, their population is very small. Um, so I would I'd wait, I will weight them much more heavily in terms of you'll go a lot redder on your map um, where they are because they, their population size and their, their speciality is much narrower and their distribution area as well. So it's a combination of distribution, population size and rarity um so yeah unfortunately that's why it's and it's also cares about how many how many what species the community in the area care about um because we biodiversity is a lot about what we actually want to see 
um, it's you know partly human driven. Okay, well we're we're uh, getting close to the the time. So one of the things that worry environmental NGOs are um, swathes of the countryside being dominated by biomass crops. Um, now let's assume that everyone agrees that we need to act quickly to fight climate change, but we also need to improve farmland and wildlife. How could we incorporate checks and balances into a scaled rollout to make sure that we don't make a big mistake? So I'll ask you that, Rebecca, first. Oh, that's a, that's a challenging one. Um, it will probably depend on. So if the I we surprise actually if every farmer in a particular area picked the crop, um, there would be a degree of concentration of the crop based on probably end user. Um, if there are schemes to fund and support the crops, if it ends up being under a scheme, then a lot of schemes. So the um, things like the countryside stewardship scheme and some of the others have a regional weighting. So you can only get a payment for certain actions in certain areas. So there is a mechanism to stop, you know, to make sure that you're not having an entire area or not supporting uh, concentration of planting in a certain area if you're going to go through a subsidy lever. If you don't have a subsidy lever, there's limited to what we can actually do because you can't stop farmers planting a crop that earns them money. Um, but I would be surprised, given the target, even with the highest level of targets, given where our end users are distributed around the country, I'd be very surprised if we have a, a huge concentration of crop in one area to the point of which you're causing a localised extinction. Um, a localised extinction sounds terrible. That means an, a species is not in that particular area. It does not mean it's going to go extinct across the whole of the UK. Um, there would potentially be, have to be alternative mechanism put in place. Um, I think it's unlikely, but not impossible. OK, and uh, Ed, uh, any views yourself? Just um, just as a, an aside, really, you know, when you when you look historically at Willow in particular, for example, there used to be withy beds, willow beds, um, you know, fix I'm in Gloucestershire and, you know, all along the seven, there were withy beds which don't exist anymore today. There might be some relics of them. Um, and 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 so actually, you know, we've got probably a, a much less willow in the countryside than what we ever used to have, you know, willow, willow trees not plantations, but willow trees would have been obviously a very common uh, addition to the wetland environment as well. So I think um, I think if anything, it's the, you know, it's, I, I like to think about this historical context as well, that actually, if anything, having more willow, like we used to have willow, withy beds, you know, could it could actually be a, a positive thing. Good. Um, there is a note from um, uh, Kevin Taylor at the um, uh, Welsh Government saying, please respond to the uh, sustainable farm uh, sch farming scheme in Wales. There, there's a, a bunch of consultation events uh, going on. I'll be going along to one of those in the future. I, I was just wondering, um, I'll come on to a couple of other questions from uh, the uh, the audience. Um, I've got one here. So uh, biomass crops have, been, have not been fully embraced by ARMS, F SFI and schemes in our devolved nations. Why do you think this might be? Uh, have a go first, Ed, and then uh, uh, Rebecca can follow. Yeah, well, really good question, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the problem with elms, again, I'm not involved with them. I sort of hear from the outside, really, from lots of different landowners and people involved, really, is that obviously there's been quite a lot of watering down of the environmental land management scheme. And it may just be that, the, you know, the people that are making the decisions, you know, are either you know, don't have enough information about them or are a bit worried or a bit cautious of them um, and, and and don't quite see how they can fit into that bigger picture. And perhaps there needs to be more uh, more injection and information of how, um, you know, plantations like Willow in particular, you know, can can contribute towards nature recovery uh, and and the production of a, a, a crop, as Rebecca was saying, this at the end of the day is, is a a a, a, a a business crop, you know. OK, Rebecca. OK, this, this is a thing. So there is there's a couple of reasons that I can think of why. I mean, obviously, it's, it's down to the policymakers. So one is the crop isn't a huge area. Um, so to invest a huge amount of money in setting up an elm scheme for a crop that's covering a, what is up to recently a small area was probably not in the high on the agenda. Not that that's, you know, that's perfectly fair for them. The other reason is, is the way that elms work. So say they're not involved is a little bit cheap because they are. They're in the countryside. You know, if you've got countryside stewardship, you can claim your headlands. The reason the bulk area of the crop is not in, as I mentioned, is because there isn't a management option. So 
The way that ELMS works is it is a compensation scheme, basically, for a farmer or a landowner for undertaking something which costs them money but benefits biodiversity or ecosystem service delivery. It has to cost them money in order for them to be compensated. We don't really have management options for low miscanthus that cost the farmers money that we can prove cost them money, or we know they cost them money, and that we know is beneficial to biodiversity or another ecosystem service. We need to give the basically the policymakers need that kind of evidence in order to do it. But they we've got we've probably got evidence that's along those lines. So things like choose varietal choice in SRC when you harvest, how big your plantation is. But they're not, they don't really easily match on to what is currently in elm schemes, which is things like beetle banks and leaving patches for skylarks within the cropped areas, not using herbicide. So it's trying, I think it might be a bit of a mind shift on their half about what is a management option for a crop that's so different. And also uh, us being able to give them potentially additional management options and costed management options. But they, there's also we need the funding to do that because that's not what the funding's being targeted for. We're catching up a little bit, I think, with these crops. A lot of the research in today have been just what is the impact of putting them in the landscape? Are there going to be a risk? And I think we've kind of got that knowledge now. And now we're moving on to how do we manage them? um as as that's now becoming an option so what variety should we pick when should we harvest them how should we manage them what do we how big do the headlands have to be that kind of thing okay I've, I've, there, there were a couple of late questions um so i am going to ask these uh um uh, even in the interest of time so uh alec alec um, mckennis of the rspb rebecca you did touch on this but interested to hear detail on the extent of evidence related to benefits to existing cropland from willow miscanthus in terms of things like increased beneficials, predators, etc. Okay, difficult. There is one study, a couple of studies that looked at it. It's actually really difficult to measure that. They haven't seen a huge amount of um, increased natural predator control in crops alongside it. So there is there is definitely a higher predatory predatory insects within the crop. Whether or not that's translating to the adjacent crop is not being shown so strongly. Some work that CH did looking at things like flower margins has suggested that to get that maximum benefit, you need to get them very close together. So basically, you need to plant the willow as a strip through the crop to maximise that kind of benefit outwards. So that's noticed with um, headland management for wildflowers. You know, that was the idea. You put wildflowers in the headland, it will increase your predatory numbers in the crop. It seems to work best if you put those wildflower strips through the crop or very close to it. So I think it's probably going to be very similar. Having said that, they definitely act as a resource for repopulating after spraying. But it's really hard to see that because so does lots of other stuff. So Evidence isn't that strong, but it should work in theory. <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask uh, um, Ed uh, principally this one. Is the type of willow used in SRC as valuable as goat willow, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, very good question. I mean, I don't. I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to have plots of goat willow or pussy willow, sallow, which is a really valuable tree for wildlife all across the countryside it's often uh, cut down it's often regarded as scrub but it's actually a very very valuable plant which is encouraged to be left and it does produce these fantastic uh, catkins in the springtime and and that's what i was kind of talking about mostly but the willow in these plantations will also you know does also produce catkins as well um but it's but that's a good question i don't know i mean i think that's something you you have to, I think, look at the different catkins being produced on these different willow subspecies and, and what have you. Maybe it's, has it already, maybe it's already been done, Rebecca, I'm not sure, but um, you'd, ha you'd have to look at those catkins. I think you'd have to look at the different sort of insects of, that are visiting uh, and perhaps even you can do this. Look at look at the amount of nectar and pollen that's coming off, say, uh, a, a good sample of different individual catkins to really get a, a grip of that. So I don't know, but it would make a really neat study, I think, to to investigate that. Yeah, I someone suppose. has looked at. I know, I know someone has looked at pollen and nectar yield from different varieties of of willow. I don't know if they've done it against goat willow. I know someone has. To, I've seen it. I've read a paper couple of days ago on it so I know someone's done it but I don't know if they compared it specifically to goat willow. Yeah I think the the important thing to remember is that there are, is plenty of wildlife based on the uh, the pictures that uh, we've shown that uh, uses um, uh, these crops and we shouldn't 
try and make uh, the best the enemy of the good because one has to remember farmers do have to try and make money from from these crops if we, we're going down that and also if we're trying to fight climate change with productive species um i think I'm, i should draw this to a close now i'm sorry if your question wasn't asked um i would just love to say thank you so much to rebecca and ed it's been a really wonderful um uh, presentations by both you. I've learned a great deal. I'm sure everyone else has on on the uh, the webinar. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, um, after Ed's uh, surveys uh, with me down in um, the southwest, we produced a couple of short videos, uh, ten minutes each on willow and miscanthus, uh, and you can see all of the birds um, or some of the birds that we saw in there. And uh, Ed's uh, really enthusiastic commentary. Ed has also written a report on 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 those uh, two surveys as well. So you can see all of the birds, 49 species in total that we saw over those three days. Um, uh, the, the, the report isn't quite online yet, but it will be in the next few days. So just a, a, a sneak preview to the next webinar. So we're moving um, a completely different direction uh, next time to managing fuel storage and trying to best practice quality standards. However, the uh, the two two of the farmer speakers there are uh, the two farmers who own the farms that uh, we did the bird surveys on. So uh, there, there is a little bit of connectivity there. And we'll be hearing from um, one of the Woodshore um, quality assurance experts, Will Richardson. So if you are interested in um, burning these crops and doing it the best, most sustainable way, then that's the uh, the webinar for you. So here are our um, partners. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a big team of people and uh, we're trying our best to do um, a great deal and, and share as much knowledge as possible. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, thank you so much to our sponsors, uh, Desnes. We couldn't do it without you. And uh, please stay connected with us um, in all of these social media handles. But uh, until the next time, um, I would just one final thank you to, to the speakers and uh, we'll see you in February. Goodbye. <laughs>